Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the Monday Night Review. It's technically a day late, so I guess this would be the Tuesday Night Review, but I spend the weekend at my mum's house with my kids and I'm feeling fairly unapologetic about that. Um, My anxiety has been through the roof at the moment, um, to the extent that I felt like I couldn't really function on Monday morning. So I'm trying to not beat myself up about the stuff I cannot control. So I'm sure you guys won't mind me being one day late with this. So today's episode is a really good example of why I love doing this and why I kind of love the internet, even though I have a real desire to spend some time in the library. If anyone's ever seen the film, it's actually my favourite film, Foul Play, Goldie Horn's character works in a library and that's pretty much um, my dream library. So it started off as one thing this week and it morphed into another. So I thought we'd go to our next stop on the A to Z of the London Tube. Now, the next stop technically is Alperton, but there are two murders that dominate any, any searches to do with Alperton and both are fairly recent and both are kind of unpleasant. One involves someone being deliberately run down right outside the tube station in some gang-related shenanigans. And the other is a stabbing in a school, and I just don't have it in me. I just don't want to be covering um, covering those. They're too grim. They're too recent, um, just for the sake of hitting all the stops. So we're counting that as Alperton. We've talked about it. That's it. Tick. Let's move on. So after Alberton, it's Amersham. Now, Amersham is one of my favourite stops on the tube because it's not even in London. It's in Buckinghamshire. Um, So you can get on the tube in London in like, I don't know, pick somewhere that's really London-y like King's Cross. I mean, you're going to have to do some changes. But you get out at Amersham, which is this lovely picturesque town in Buckinghamshire and it's in it's so like beautiful that it's used in loads of tv programs including loads of episodes of Midsummer Murders it's just full of character and beautiful and I just there's something lovely about the fact that you can get the tube there so if you are a visitor to London and you fancy going as far out into the countryside on the tube as you can then then pick Amersham because it's really pretty. But frankly, I'm surprised anyone lives there because when you look at the hauntings in Amersham, there are fistfuls. And there's one that's mentioned by Andrew Green, who is my ghost hunting god. And that's the Checkers Pub. And it has got some history to it. So we're going to start there today. There is the most excellent Pathé film from the 60s about this pub which I will try and link somewhere or I'll try and save as upload a clip of it onto social media. It's just got the most, it's black and white and it's got the most, you know, those, that old fashioned clipped pronunciation and, and just everyone's having a jolly good time in the pub, but there's something a bit wrong going on here. It's just fantastic. So I'll try and upload that somewhere. So the Chequers Pub is a grade two listed 15th century coaching inn built for people who were travelling from London to the West Country. Now, in the 1500s, some lollards who are a sort of pre-Protestant Protestant religious following, so not Catholics, basically, were rounded up and charged with heresy. So without wanting to go into theological details, I'm not going to do that here, but... Um, they were not not anti-Catholic, but they were very much not Catholics. And they were rounded up and they had a short trial. And after the trial, seven of them were condemned to be burned at the stake, which is what happened to you if you were deemed to be a heretic. So they were held at the Chequers Inn before the punishment was carried out. So originally it was in in loads of stories you'll read that all seven of them were held there at the same time but actually it seems that just three were held there and not all at the same time. William Tilesworth was the first in 1506 and the others were in 1522 so they were held there for the days before they were set to be burned at the stake. 
So one of the most um, reported sightings is of a woman in a white hooded dress. And this apparition is believed to be the daughter of William Tilesworth. She appears in bedrooms while guests are trying to sleep. Uh, she walks around the room and then disappears through walls. Um, and originally when I started reading about this, I was like, what nonsense? Why would she be there? She was. She died years after her father. There's no reason for her to be tied to the place where he was held. But there is a monument that stands in memory of the martyrs who were all burned there for heresy. And it mentions her. She's called Joan Clark. And she was forced to light the fire to burn her father, as were the children of later martyrs burned at Amersham. So this was a tradition, I think, to save your own life. Basically, you were forced to light the fire under your family member. Which is just, I just, my mind boggles that this was deemed acceptable and okay and and a religious undertaking anyway so it's suggested that joan is this woman in white she she's also it, this this shrieking can be heard and it's believed that she's the source of the shrieking because of the horror of having set fire to her own father i've put here people are so fucking horrendous so in case you ever think i'm not hugely eloquent the specter that andrew green talks about though is that of a hooded figure and loads of people have seen him as well and he is believed to be mr osman who's the jailer who guarded the martyrs before they went to the death went to their death He's a figure in a black hood and he's seen in the bar area and by the fireplace and he's seen quite often. Um, the appearance of this man is often preceded or followed by a deep sense of foreboding. And some people have seen him whilst others don't. So that I've read stories where some people will say, who's that hooded man standing next to the fireplace? And people are like, there's no one there. In the 19th century, the body of a chimney sweep was found outside the pub. It was never proved what had happened to him, but many believed that he'd been mugged, beaten and left for dead. His soot-covered figure is seen going about his business with not sort of noticing that anyone else is there. There's a long history of landlords moving out. In the 1960s, when the amazing film was made, the Wilsons kept hearing noises during the night, taps on the barrels were turned on, and eventually, after barely any sleep, they left. One of the landlords was a former private detective, and he couldn't deal with the shrieks and the screams that often happened during, his no during the night. His daughter saw a white hooded figure in her bedroom often, and that was enough of that. Once she couldn't sleep, I mean, everyone's been there. It's one thing if I'm not sleeping. It's quite... If, if anyone wakes my kids up, I'm fully going for them. So I identify with that. So there are reports of exorcisms taking place in 1953, 1963, and again in 1982. Those are just the ones that are recorded. But seemingly, none of them made any difference. It's, Amersham's actually been thought of as for a long time as one of the most haunted places in England. But while researching this episode, I found something altogether more sinister that I kept reading about, so I thought I should cover it. In the early hours of Thursday the 10th of November 1966, a car was found in the lay-by on the Amersham Beaconsfield Road next to the Magpie Pub. At 2pm, that afternoon, the body of 59-year-old Dr. Helen Davidson was found in a clearing in Hodgemore Wood, half a mile from her car, by one of the more by one of the soldiers who were out searching for her. He'd heard a whimpering of her wire-haired fox terrier fancy, who was found cuddled against Dr. Davidson's body. Davidson had driven up to the woods to walk her dog and do some bird watching the day before, as she did every Wednesday afternoon, which was her afternoon off, and hadn't returned home. Dr. Davidson had lived in the area for over 20 years, 
and was an incredibly popular figure with many of the people from the town using her as their local GP. She delivered babies, went on home visits and was often described as going above and beyond the call of duty. So what had happened in the days before her death? Before going to the woods that afternoon, Davidson had gone to spend time with her elderly mother who had recently moved nearby she will have got to the woods just after 4 p.m and it would have got dark relatively soon after that is november in the uk so she wouldn't have been planning on being out too long she probably would have been out for an hour or so and she and her husband were due to go out for supper that evening so when she didn't return home he became concerned he called the local hospital to see if she'd gone in on a work call. Maybe a patient had gone into labour. But when he saw that hadn't heard from her a few hours later, he called the police. So police started to search immediately, but didn't find her car until about 2am the next morning. And then they called off the search because it was just too dark to search the woods. So they started again at first light and they got about 100 soldiers to help them search she was found approximately a mile from where she parked her car in a secluded clearing where no one would have passed or heard her if she'd screamed fancy was defending the body not letting anyone near and in the end they had to make a request for a dog handler and then fancy was taken to the nearby farm to be looked after by the farmer's daughter the murderer had discarded the weapon which was a two foot six inch piece of charred wood believed to be a poplar branch and they found that near the body though she is believed to have died fairly instantly from the initial blow to her, her head her attacker had ground her head into the earth and pushed her eyes back into her skull um he'd continued beating her long after she was dead and stepping on her face and locals say that the hole made by her head was visible in the ground for years afterwards. The post-mortem confirmed that the motive for Davidson's murder wasn't sexual. There's no robbery. She had her wallet on her, her handbag and her car keys were in her pocket. Her handbag and her work bag were in the car, which was locked and the car was left there. Uh, so immediately they started wondering why this had happened was it a disgruntled patient which seems unlikely she was incredibly popular with her patients whether she'd disturbed people bonking in the woods who hadn't have been who shouldn't have been or whether there was a murdering lunatic on the loose they went door to door asking for any witnesses walkers dog walkers and bird watchers used the woods but no one had seen anything the wood itself at the time was dense with trees and vegetation. Most dog walkers uh, would keep to the edge and sort of go around the outside of the wood and only those who needed more secrecy or quiet would venture further in. So Davidson would go further in because she was a really keen bird watcher. Others would go in for more clandestine reasons. So what was the killer doing there? She was killed within office hours, meaning no one when questioned had been reported missing from work without an alibi they needed to narrow it down to see who would be free to be in the woods at this time it's not a big city there's a limited amount of people who would have had access to this wood uh, people who were meeting for a tryst would usually remain in their cars especially at this time of year because it's cold for you to get your kit off it's about seven degrees celsius on that day and there were these sort of concrete slabs that people would park on and people would often see the, the window steamed up. It seems to be quite the spot for lovers. It also appeared that she must have known her killer or possibly not seen them coming. She had no defensive wounds. So though her gloves were covered in blood and she was attacked from the front, it could be that she sort of put her hands up to her face as she went down. Um... But it was such a violent attack. So attacks to the face are often very much an indicator of personal hatred. Uh, and this one was very frenzied and continued long after she was dead. 
So it really implies that the killer knew it wasn't just a random act of of murder. It was someone who knew her. At some point, the killer would have had to have disposed of their bloody clothing. So police were hoping that a family member would have noticed and reported it. But again, if the killer have disposed of the clothes before getting home or if they lived alone, no one's going to have seen anything. So there's no evidence of any sexual interference with Davidson but the police interviewed all the local sex offenders anyone who had a criminal record anyone who had a history of violence all of whom had an alibi for the time of the murder and then after that the list of suspects sort of sort of dries up they decided it must have been a crime of opportunity but no murder like this had happened in the area before and these are not experienced policemen with this kind of violent crime so they have help from police in london but it doesn't really help that much they decided it must be a crime of opportunity so despite there's an offer from the news of the world in 1977 offering a hundred thousand pounds for the for a reward for the the murder but it remains unsolved and was ruled as a random motiveless killing so locals believed that the answer was that Davidson should have seen, would have seen something she shouldn't have done. Lovers in the forest, maybe, and possibly gay lovers. And this would explain why the face was so damaged and the eyes. It was illegal to be gay in the UK until 1967. So anyone caught would have faced a prison sentence. Violent murder still seems like a long stretch for most sane people, even if you have been caught. Um with your trousers down they checked local doctors hospitals and chemists to see if anyone had come in with a dog bite fancy was really distressed when they found them and wouldn't let anyone near the body so the chances are the dog will have bit someone who was carrying out the attack but it the this line of inquiry turned up nothing and they thought that actually they the possibility is that the Murderer will have been wearing a, a thick winter coat because it was so cold out. That might have protected them from the dog. So who can have committed this rage-filled attack? As we know, anyone who's into true crime, this is rarely a one-off. If it's going to be a motiveless, random killing, there would be more of them. And you don't kind of sit in the middle of barely used woods waiting and hoping for someone to come along that you can kill so when someone's murdered it's usual to check out the situation with their spouse or partner and davidson's husband herbert baker is a widower he's 30 years her senior they had been married not not for long and he was in no way as popular as his wife everyone was slightly confused about this marriage by the time of her death, they'd been married for five years and he was known to have slightly tyrannical religious beliefs which he subjected his neighbours to on many occasions. And he seems to be as sort of brash as his wife is kind. He is retired from working in the city and he has a very close relationship with his housekeeper, Kathleen Cook, who worked for him and his first wife, ruby she started working with them when she was in her teens and together they nursed his first wife through her last illness and many believed including kathleen that herbert would marry her after his wife's death but instead he married the gp who had attended his first wife upon their marriage baker moved in with his new wife to her house and kathleen moved into herbert's old house where she lived rent-free as a recluse and hoarder, and he spent most of his days there doing what we don't know. So many people had believed during his first marriage that he had been having an affair with Kathleen, though there was no proof. And then he seems to spend most days with her during his second marriage whilst his wife's at work. Whether his wife knows about this or not, we don't know. Davidson and Baker didn't socialise much together, though we know they were due to go out for supper the night she died. They were due to go to the local reverend's house for supper with his him and his wife. And 
Baker was a lay preacher. So could be that unless it was church related, they didn't really socialize together. It's it's very weird. It doesn't seem to be a happy marriage. No one can understand why they got married. No one really likes her husband. And she seems really popular. He's also 30 years older than her and has this strange relationship with the housekeeper. Kathleen Cook does not like Davidson. She has the most to gain from her murder, but the police interview her numerous times. They dig up both her front and back garden. No evidence is found linking her to the murder. She's known locally as the murderess for years afterwards. And when Herbert dies in 1975, he leaves half his estate to her, including his house and Davidson's house. So just days after Davidson's murder, Herbert, who's the part-time lay preacher, takes a sermon in a nearby village, which seems really soon after the death of your wife. But he may have felt, as many of his generation did, that the show must go on and he should fulfil his obligations. And during the service, he asks the congregation to forgive the murderer, which, again, seems kind of strange. He was her sole beneficiary. He inherited around 25000 and her, her house. People have killed for less, but he wasn't strapped for cash himself. So it, it all seems very weird. What is extremely odd is that just over a year after she dies, Herbert goes on holiday to Scotland and he calls the police up to ask for the binoculars that had been round his dead wife's neck when she died. When they found her, one of the eye lenses was completely covered in blood, making them think that maybe she didn't see the attacker coming because she was holding the binoculars up to her face when she died. So he wants to take these on holiday to Scotland. Just get a new pair of binoculars, Herbert. Well, you've just inherited 25,000. Very odd. But he's interviewed many times. His alibi checks out. Kathleen's alibi checks out, but she says she was at home all afternoon. So he could easily be covering for her. Anyway, so this case goes completely cold. It's open, but no one's got any leads to go on. But Monica Weller is an author and she lives in Amersham. She's going to Amersham to give a talk about her book on Ruth Ellis, who in 1955 was the last woman in Britain to be hanged. And after her talk, she's approached by this woman in the audience whose older sister had been delivered by Dr. Davidson. And the baby had spina bifida and had died when she was a day old. And a fortnight later, the GP was murdered. So Marston has all these collected press cuttings about the case, which she offered to pass on to Weller, who became really fascinated, especially by this ruling that it's like a random motiveless killing, which seems so unlikely. So at the time, there was hardly any information on the internet. So over the next seven years... She investigates this murder. She speaks to anyone she can find who knew, who knew Dr. Davidson. She speaks to anyone who was involved in the crime. She manages to track down the doctor who performed the post-mortem. She basically gets loads of information and she discovers a few things. It turns out that Davidson wasn't universally adored, as was initially thought. Apart from Kathleen Cook, who didn't like Davidson, there were a couple of others. The first person to consider is Michael Larkham, a man who she had injured in an accident. She was pulling out from a junction. He was driving up to the junction in his motorbike and she stalled as she pulled out of the junction and he went into her and uh, he fractured his skull, lost seven teeth, dislocated his hip um, broke loads of bones and he woke up from his coma after a month and his life was never the same again this accident happened when he was 21 and he felt she got off really lightly in court and that she'd been let off because she knew the right people and he was overheard saying if he ever saw her he would kill her but he was in prison for car theft at the time of the murder so he was ruled out 
when well I was talking to people in Amersham the name George Garbett kept cropping up he was a live-in gardener for a, for a prominent London businessman who lived on the outskirts of Hodgemoor Wood. Garbett had suffered a brain injury during the Second World War and he'd had a metal plate inserted into his head and he uh, was a bit of uh, a quirky chap. He was a part-time bus driver in Amersham. He was reportedly bisexual with a preference for men he got married when he was 39 but it was all a marriage of convenience apparently he was allegedly impotent and a loner he kept inserting himself into the investigation and we got some information from his gp so his gp who works at a different practice to davidson and she believes he was close to making a confession he would apparently say he hadn't killed davidson even when that wasn't what the conversation about was about he would randomly just announce that he didn't kill her he did mention that he'd done something terrible to a woman but he wouldn't say more than that he was due to see his gp on the 23rd of july 1971 and she felt sure that he was finally going to confess to the murder. But he never turned up. That day he went to the garage where he kept his car, poured a gar- gallon of petrol over himself, got in his car and set himself alight. He left no suicide note. His notes and confidential conversations with his GP will be available in 2071, a hundred years after his death. So whether he kind of left inconclusive evidence in his conversations to his gp but she said afterwards she believed he was very close to confessing but that's as maybe but what would make this quite introvert murder a well-liked gp who he seemingly had nothing to do with well the air of the woods where dr davidson was found was renowned as a meeting place for courting couples by day and homosexuals by night and miss weller the author believes that Garbett killed the GP because he feared she would expose his activities there. Again, homosexuality at the time was illegal and um, it may well be that she had seen something she shouldn't have done. Uh, The bus depot where he worked was opposite the GP surgery where Davidson worked, so it could well be that they knew each other by sight or that he became convinced she knew something she didn't. He worked on the morning of the 9th of November, the morning of the attack on Davidson. And it's Garbett who Weller Weller believes is the culprit. She says that she has solved this murder and it is Garbett who's done it. There are other people who believe that Kathleen Cook is the murderer but the fact is i don't think we're ever going to find out there's no way of checking for dna garbit obviously died in in by suicide it was not a sexual attack so there's no dna left on the body and that is it that's the murder of dr helen davidson bit ended up being a bit longer than i had planned but Uh, It was kind of creepy and fascinating. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm sorry if it's weirdly edited, but I still have a cough. Less snotty, still have a cough. It's not the cough, but it's a cough nonetheless. And I will see you next week. And I have been getting some really good recommendations. So thank you so much if you have sent me story suggestions. I've been loving them. You can come and follow us at The Monday Night Review on Facebook and Instagram. You can send us an email to themondaynightreview at gmail.com and you can buy us a coffee. I say buy us. It's basically just me with my trusty right-hand woman, Holly. So if you fancy buying us a book or buying us a coffee, you can. There's a link in the show notes. And I will see you next week. And until then, stay safe, be kind, and always check the back seat before you drive.